and welcome to News Click. And today we're going to be talking about the US government's decision to withdraw from the World Health Organization. Now, this decision was notified to Congress on Tuesday and is a one year long process. And if it is not reversed, the US could leave the WHO by July 6 next year. Now, this has raised a lot of questions, especially regarding the funding of the World Health Organization. The US is the single largest contributor, giving around at least around 14% of its budget. It also has a huge amount it has to pay to the World Health Organization. The latest numbers are around $100 million and 100 million Swiss francs that it owes to the WHO. So we have Prabir Purgaya to talk about some of these issues. So Prabir, could we first start by looking at some of the numbers involved, especially around the budgets and the finances? What is likely to be the impact on the WHO and why is it significant? Well, WHO has been the only organization that we have globally in which all con countries can contribute to fight pandemics. And let's understand there is no institution globally which exists apart from WHO to jointly fight pandemics because pandemics are not limited to a country. Unfortunately, for those who believe in nationalism of this kind, my country before everybody else in the world, they seem to forget that they, other countries may recognize borders, but unfortunately the microbes don't. So therefore pandemics are a threat to all the people in the world. And if you do not have a coordinated international body which can help fight it, then we are really going to be in much deeper waters than we are today. So effectively what the US is doing is in trying to dismember all international platforms, whether it's the WTO earlier, it's the UNESCO even earlier than that, all the international agreements that they have signed, the Kyoto Protocols to the Paris Agreement, all of which they're not a party to, and they have withdrawn whatever they were party to. So given all of that, this is in a long series, series of what would be called US exceptionalism to dismantle the global structure in the belief they don't need anybody else and therefore they're okay. And why should they pay anybody else for global coordination? All they have to do is keep themselves safe. Now, pandemic has shown that this doesn't work. Coronavirus is uh, the novel coronavirus for SARS-CoV-2, which is the cause of the COVID-19 disease, has clearly shown that the US failed badly in trying to handle this pandemic. Now it needs to blame somebody and particularly Trump as his niece has detailed in her latest book is essentially a narcissistic figure. So somebody has to pay, can't certainly be him for his complete disaster of a handling of the pandemic in the United States. And somebody needs to be made the scapegoat, China being one and WHO being the other. So the question that arises is you talked about WHO's budget. Well, let's look at WHO's budget. It's a very small budget for the task they have been given. If you want to fight global pandemic with a budget that's that small, that itself shows the enormity of the work the WHO has done, because this is equal to the budget of, say, one Johns Hopkins public health institution in the United States. It's one tenth the budget of CDC or the National Institute of Health in the United States. So these are really not big budgets at all. For the task which has been given that not only generate health policies globally, create structures to fight pandemics and provide a whole bunch of other things. So I think that expectation that WHO having not succeeded in fighting the pandemic is a bogus understanding because WHO doesn't fight pandemics by itself. It fights pandemics in coordination with the countries. And in fact, it has no sovereign, so no rights over any country. It can only advise each country is sovereign and carries out its own policies. So effectively asking WHO to stop pandemics is a bogus understanding. Was WHO coordinating? An answer is yes. It has coordinated in fight against Ebola. Just imagine if an Ebola pandemic had broken out, what it would do to the world. And in, even in COVID-19, it has been the tripwire that existed, warned people in January, end of January itself, this pandemic is going to hit us. In fact, the, they had said clearly that this is going to become a pandemic. And if we did not heed that warning, if the United States didn't heed that warning, that's to the count of Mr. Trump and the United States. 
So this is the complete bogus uh, argument that the US is now trying to give, that China didn't tell us, though uh, China, CDC of China informed CDC United States on the 3rd of January. So they had at least two and a half to three months to prepare for the pandemic which hit them and ultimately hit them from, the, from Europe. It didn't hit them from China. So these are the, essentially the base things that are there. But I would like to take you to what's the other issue of the pandemic really is. The pandemic that was expected, which is still expected, is a huge, at some point of time, flu, similar to the 1918 epidemic. And there are enough flu strains going around, which seem to be quite dangerous, versions of uh, swine avian flus. And as we know, the reassortment of these that take this continuously, that all of this can lead to a, of a pandemic, which will be much more serious than the swine flu pandemic, which started from North America, or what other pandemics we have seen for the last 100, 100 years, except, except, of course, the biggie, which is the 1918 uh, uh, flu pandemic. Now, if we look at these, our protection for flu is through what is called the flu vaccine. At the moment, 95% of the flu doses are used in the United States, Europe, and Western Pacific, which also covers China and Australia. US uses the largest amount of it. 5% is used in Africa, what's called Eastern Mediterranean, which is really uh, the Asian part of the Mediterranean uh, Ocean and then South Southeastern Asia, which is really the rest of the world, which is 50% of the global population. This particular system, which needs to then create the flu vaccines, are most useful for the United States. But who creates the flu vaccine? This is done by a WHO coordinated program, which gets all the parties in the world together. And this is called the GISRS program. I'll talk about what this is just in a little while. This is gets from different places. What are the flu virus samples that exist? Gets it in one place. Then they meet and decide which is the flu vaccine mm -hmm. for this season that must be prepared. And they meet this twice and do it twice a year, basically because of Southern and Northern Hemisphere. Now, this program is across different institutions in the world. There are WHO collaborating centers, which are really the key institutions there. But the whole bunch of other centers, which collect virus, sent it to WHO, and is essential for collecting all the information that it has worldwide. Now, in 2017, for which WHO has shared the data, in 2017 alone, they collected three and a half million specimens. 40,000 virus specimens were shared with WHO from different countries, 110 countries. 10,000 viruses were characterized by WHO centers and 45 candidate vaccine viruses developed for development of the vaccine. So 45 candidate, candidate vaccines were developed under WHO and these were the ones then which went into production and which were used by different countries. Now, this entire system operates based on the fact that twice a year, the experts meet in WHO headquarters, and based on this data, which we talked about, they could decide what is to be used for vaccination. And as I said, US is the country which uses the maximum number of flu vaccines in the world. And if the US didn't have this information, it would really be flying blind. This is what their experts are themselves saying. Now, where does this, why do countries share this virus samples? This is a very big issue because if you share virus samples, you are basically sharing genetic material for which if you go back to the companies which produce the vaccine, you might have to pay high cost. And typically for a lot of the countries, the cost is high given the per capita income of their countries. So something like $20 a flu shot, which may not seem exorbitant if you're in the West, West, in Western Europe or in Europe or uh, United States, is a quite a huge cost if it comes to large parts of Africa. And if you do it every year, 
or even in South Asia, for large parts of the population, this is a high cost. Now, this is why they have, countries have been saying, okay, we are sharing with WHO, and there is no other institution that today exists for sharing this uh, flu viruses. And okay, we share the virus, but what about share returns to us? Can, can we get access to cheap vaccine? Now, that's a debate which is going on, so I'm going to leave that out. But what I'm focusing on is why do countries share the virus specimens they have? Because they expect that the vaccine will help them. Now, if this is going to help the United States, who is not a party to WHO, and it will not help others, because they are going to separate from WHO anyway, they're not going to even support WHO with their contributions, the question is, it becomes a completely one-sided relationship. And that's what the U.S. is saying. I will take from you, but I'll give nothing in return. Now, the reason that the U.S. pays the highest share, it has the highest income in the world as a country. It doesn't give it out of uh, love for, say, public health in the world. It gives it out of the fact that this was the principle decided for the UN, what will be the share of each country. And that's what U.S. gives. After that, it gives money for those programs, which is think it's important for it for its own protection, for its own reasons, they give a certain amount of money. For instance, they did give a certain amount for AIDS because AIDS was coming back to hit them. Initially, they thought it was something in Africa. It came back. If, again, initially, they thought it is, you know, amongst only a certain section of the population. And because there are a lot of homophobic uh, senior uh, officials in the United States, they thought this not of concern to the general population. When it become a, a, something which hit everybody, or it had the potential to hit everybody, then of course they made a certain amount of contribution, even to the WHO budget of the AIDS programs and so on. So these are issues which the WHO has been useful, not only for third world countries, as the, the United States seems to think, but for itself. Now the question is, is there any other mechanism which can be used? Now, I would finally end with the most important point in the current pandemic, that if you remember, while the Chinese had informed WHO on December 30th, 31st, had informed the United States on January 3rd, they had the genome sequence which had gone to Gene Bank. Now, Gene Bank, Bank is a part of the United States National Repository. So the Chinese had actually uploaded in the Gene Bank. Gene Bank hadn't put it up till 12, uh, January 12th. We don't know why. This is still, at the moment, not clear to us. Maybe the Chinese had embargoed pending a publication, or it is possible that they just were going through their own internal uh, procedures before they would upload it. Then the Chinese uploaded again to a basically a global genomic data bank, which is, I think, GIS uh, ID. Just have a quick look at what that is. Uh, this, this is the other gene bank which is there, which is basically the platform for flu viruses. This was set up by a whole bunch of uh, public uh, trusts and other agencies and big coordinates with WHO for the virus samples and so on. But the basic sharing of the genome, which has become the primary way to share virus data, is in this global data bank, which was put up in 2000, which was put up in January 12th. Now the question is, or January 11th, the question is, if we don't have platforms for doing this, what would be called public science, how do we actually do public health? And if we do not do public health, then unfortunately for the globe, pandemics will then hit us harder. Every time a new pandemic breaks breaks upon us, breaks through, as it were, it's going to hit us very hard. Now, experts are still talking about that this is not the big one. The big one is still to come. And they think a variant of avian flu, variant of avian plus swine flu, is going to become much harder. And if that happens, we might see deaths on a much higher scale. So this tripwire mechanism, which is what the WHO runs, is our only protection against such pandemic. And it is unfortunate that the United States has made WHO the scapegoat for its own failure. Absolutely. And the other key issue, of course, is the fact that when it comes to countries, there is a concept of 
assess contributions which are mandatory versus uh, which voluntary. And once a country like the US withdraws, what it opens up the space for is for private interest to have a much larger say in the WHO because of the amount they're able to give. Well, that's already happened because of the dwindling share of the budget in WHO. That is not really increasing compared to the kind of tasks it is supposed to uh, meet. And the fact that the US doesn't really give its full share, it promises and generally is a laggard. It's even now in default for major payments to the to WHO. And that's one of the conditions that they can only leave after they've cleared the dues. And I think they have about 100 million odd dollars of dues spending with WHO at the moment. So what's happened, it have already happened, is private funding agencies, private funds like Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, have already started make, uh, making up a major share of the WHO's budget. What it does is they go to specific programs. And those specific programs cannot be then under the democratic control of the countries. It effectively is the donor who decides what funding will happen. And then WHO becomes quasi-NGO looking for funds. And if it looks for funds, then it will go to those donors who have the money and they will dictate what are the programs that WHO must follow. So this has already been there. The WHO was being co-opted in some sense by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other such foundations. So it hasn't taken up the patent issue as sharply as we would have wanted it to, because what they've done is for what is called a patent pool. And a common patent pool, which is what the Bill Melinda Gates Foundations and other foundations, Welcome Foundation, various other foundations have been talking about, plus backed by, of course, the countries like the rich countries like Germany, France, and others, which does, in fact, in this pandemic, may still get us a cheap vaccine. It's possible. We're not sure if the US becomes successful and it has the only vaccine which is useful. In that case, we need to really worry, like we have seen for remdesivir and what happens. Right. But the basic issue is that even that in a pandemic, why should that be? Why should we not declare that all countries support that there should be no patent rights, there should be no intellectual property rights on vaccines and medicines for this particular pandemic? So that is something which would have been a much more fitting reply. But even the common patent pool is what the US doesn't agree to. But what happens is the policies of WHO then become dictated by funders, as you say, and it is that they, they are not then going to ask for easy access, no patent policies, for e even under pandemics, but then agree to what Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation would be saying. And that is unfortunately what is going to happen even more once the United States pulls out of it, because yes, it's, a, it's going to leave a $400 billion gap in their biannual budget. So this is or a $200 million gap in their annual budget. So this is something that is going to be of a great deal of concern. And yes, I think what the United States is doing, and this is something it has done for every now international organization, that either sink it or make it completely subservient to what his own interests are. And their own interests are clearly that of intellectual property rights being the instrument for their global you know, dominance. And this is something which they, are, they have been very clear about for a long, long time. This is what the WTO trips agreement was all about, really. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching this clip. Thank <laughs> you.